Welcome, and this is session number three of our study of the prophecy and the end times events. Uh, we are doing an in-depth dive into what the Bible has to say about the end times, and we are looking at multiple uh, multiple timelines and multiple things that the Bible says, Old Testament and New Testament, that have to deal with the end times events. Uh, normally, this class is held in person, but um, unavailable to hold it in person for the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to be releasing a recording where we are going through uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, in particular, for the next two weeks, we're going to be going through Daniel chapter 9. Uh, let's pray as we begin and dive into our study uh, here today. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to study your word, to grow in faith, Lord. Help us to have a deepened sense of understanding of the end times events. Help us, Lord, to be deeply encouraged today uh, by what your word tells us. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, let's help us to see how your hand has been at work in all of these things. <clears throat> None of these things are accidents. None of these things catch you by surprise. You have prophesied about the events that are going to happen. And I just pray, Father, that we would be in tune and in step with you. Lord, bless this time now as we dive into your word. Teach us through your through your Holy Spirit. Uh, teach us by your power and help us to understand uh, your grace. Help us to be encouraged and steadfast, persevering and enduring through the troubled times that are going to be coming before us. We thank you. And we pray for your, your help as we learn and open your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, I'm going to encourage you, if you have a Bible, to uh, turn to, to uh, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, uh, as we dive into uh, to the study here today. And uh, Daniel really is broken down into multiple different segments. There are there are four uh, or five different uh, prophecies that are given in the book of Daniel that are vitally important to our understanding. Uh, this is one of them. In fact, this is one of the greatest chapters in the Old Testament. This chapter points to the coming of Jesus uh, as Messiah. It points to the timeline of when that would take place. It is something that should not have caught the Jews off guard. They should have been looking for it, but they did not under understand what God was telling them. Uh, we need to understand exactly what God is telling us. And so uh, what we're going to go through here today, and we're going to take two weeks to go through chapter 9, but today we're going to start in and look at a lot of the of the introduction of Daniel chapter nine. Um, we're gonna look a little bit about uh, at the context. We're gonna look at the example that Daniel gives. We're gonna look at a prophecy out of Jeremiah that Daniel is referencing. Um, we're gonna look a little bit about Daniel's personal story in his life. And uh, then we will get into next week, this thing called the 70 weeks. So there are three components of Daniel nine that's really being talked about. One, you have uh, the past, uh, you had the present, which was Daniel's life specifically. Daniel was living in that present moment. And then you have future events that were going to happen. Uh, not only the future events of the coming of Messiah, but the future events of the end times that Daniel chapter 9 is going to lay out. So those three things that are very important, uh, there is the context of Daniel as it relates to the past, the present, and what's going to happen in the future. So let's dive into this. And I want to start with um, this first part, the context of Daniel 9. So let's let's try to understand a little bit about the background and about the setting of what is going on as Daniel chapter 9 is taking place. So one of the things uh, that's important to note is that this is nearing the end of Daniel's life, or he is maybe not the end, but he is an old man at this time. Uh, they had been in captivity for almost 70 years at the time of Daniel chapter 9 of this event taking place. Um, Daniel would have been uh, a young, uh, maybe early teens at the time. So he's probably around um, in his 70s or 80s at the time that Daniel chapter 9 is taking place. Now remember, we have talked about multiple timelines that have been happening um, here in the Old Testament and in the New Testament to understand what's going on uh, in the end times events. And I've given you several of those timelines. Uh, I don't have a whiteboard in front of me today to be able to illustrate, so I'm going to illustrate for you here just on your computer screen. So they have, we have, uh, 
we have these timelines that have been going on and the timelines that we have been following have been first there's been the timeline of the restoration of the nation of Israel so Israel is one of those big timeline events that that we need to understand then you have uh, and none of this would happen if Israel had not been brought back uh, into existence so that was a necessary thing for Israel to come back. Then you have what is going on in the book of Daniel. You have the uh, the events of the Antichrist and the Antichrist empire. So that empire is uh, being built and we have seen that through what has happened in the book of Daniel. You have the timeline events that are happening in the book of Matthew and Matthew is really talking to the disciples specifically uh, and that would be believers in Christ. Believers in Christ, this is the things that you need to watch for. Here are the events that are going to happen and it really zeroes in on the final seven years of what is going on and then you have the timeline in the book of Revelation and Revelation really deals with the end of the church age. So the church age is what exists from the time of Christ at his ascension and the filling of the Holy Spirit that happened at the beginning of the book of Acts all the way through until the end times events begin, until the tribulation begins. So from the time of Pentecost until the time of the... Um, <clears throat> until the time that the church age has been closed and that seven year tribulation time is beginning, that is called the church age. So what Revelation does is it picks it up at the end of the church age. In fact, there are seven letters given to the church. Those those can mean a variety of things. Those are those were literal churches that are in modern day Turkey today. Uh, those literal churches were given a warning. They were given a confrontation. And then there was a word of word of perseverance that was given to each one of them about overcoming and about enduring. And that, by the way, is given to really the believers at the end, uh, the ones that will be going through the end times events. And so we'll look at that. But at the end of the, those first three chapters of Revelation, after the seven churches have been given their warnings, and again, those are varieties of meanings in that, then you see the the culmination of the end of the church age, which is the context for and the setting required for the seven years of tribulation. Uh, the seven year events that are going to be going on that start with the seals, that move on to the trumpets, that move on to the bulls of wrath, that really talk about the, uh, the final battles that will be going on. So that is the context um, of what is going on as far as the timeline is concerned. Now the, the context for helping us to understand um, exactly what is going on, not just in the, um, not just in those uh, end times uh, events, all those timelines, but what specifically is happening in the book of, of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, you're going to have uh, three primary, four, well, I'm sorry, five primary um, prophecies that are going to be given. And all of these prophecies that are given in the book of Daniel are very, very important. So let's let's talk about these. And you could divide all of these timelines into, or all of these events into uh, some different categories. First, you have the category that is dealing with primarily is the very first thing is this idea of the statue. Now, the statue that happens in Daniel chapter two was the idea of what is going to be coming as far as the kingdoms in the world. Now, the kingdoms in the world is not an all uh, a comprehensive list. It's not an all inclusive list. It is primarily the kingdoms that would be in power in the same region that Babylon was going to be in power. And so it's not going to have, you know, the British Empire, the the um, the French Empire when it was at its its height with Napoleon. Uh, it's not going to have the Roman Empire. Um, not all of the empires. The United States is not represented there. It is specifically the empires that are controlling the Middle Eastern area. And that statue uh, showed us the context of what would happen in the fact that it would be, <clears throat> you would have uh, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Medo Empire, uh, you would have the Greek Empire, then you would have this uh, empire made of iron, the empire would go away and it would be revived again. And now most likely, and that's what we have been talking about, <clears throat> that that empire would be what was the Ottoman Empire. That Ottoman Empire was gone. It was it was there for for you know almost um, almost 800 years, I believe, is is about the timeline. A little under 800 years. Uh, that empire has gone away. 
But right now there is a desire to revive that Ottoman Empire. Then you had Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, you're going to have the picture of this, uh, again, saying the same thing, the statues, but you're going to have it represented in four different beasts. And those four different beasts represented um, what was going to be coming. And the four beasts represented, again, the, um, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the revived Ottoman Empire. Now, the fourth beast that it talks about is the most devastating beast of all the beasts that there are. Um, it was it was a powerful beast. They had not seen anything like it. And if you think about what could happen militarily um, in the Middle East with the result of, of all of the power and the technology that we have, that makes sense that that fourth beast could be just incredibly powerful and incredibly devastating in all that happens. Then you have in Daniel chapter 8, you have another prophecy. And the prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 that we talked about last time was the uh, was the prophecy that talked about these two different beasts uh, and the two different beasts and they weren't even beasts. There was this picture of a of a uh, of a ram, and there was a picture of a goat. Now the ram was the Medo Persian Empire. It had two horns. One grew up uh, first. The other grew up second. The second one grew up larger. The horn was larger, but the ram was defeated, and it was defeated by a, an, an enemy that would come from the uh, come from the east. And I'm sorry, come from the west. And the enemy from the west was this goat. Now you remember we talked about this this unicorn super goat. Uh, the goat had one large horn growing out of its head, and it it crossed like it was flying across the Middle East, and that is the empire of the Greeks. It was Alexander the Great who came and utterly destroyed the ram, the Medo-Persian empire that had existed, and it took over all of the Middle Eastern area. And then it talks specifically about out of this ram, uh, or out of this goat, the horn would be broken off, and four other horns would grow up out of this, and that was the kingdoms that would grow up out of Alexander. And those four kingdoms never had the power that the uh, the Greek empire that Alexander had, but they also, but they did have certain areas that they ruled over. There was the Greece area, there was the Middle Eastern area, there was the Egyptian area, and then there was one that was kind of modern day uh, Turkey, Macedonia area. And it says that out of one of these four will be the one, the one little horn that will come up. That one little horn will be the Antichrist. So the Antichrist, and it's warning here that the Antichrist is going to come out of one of these four empires. Now, those empires don't exist, and so it's not literally saying out of a empire that is still here, what it's referring to is the lands, the lands that were covered. The, it's gonna come out of one of the four kingdoms areas of land. So you can look for an Antichrist to be rising up out of the Middle East, out of Turkey, out of Greece, out of Egypt. Now we can rule out most likely Greece and and uh, Egypt out of that because they don't fit in the end times events. So most likely the Antichrist will come out of a Middle Eastern empire or come out of the Turkish empire. Both of those make, make sense. Now, over here in the fourth beast, in, the, in our second uh, prophecy that Daniel had, or the second vision that Daniel had, he again also talked about this idea of a little horn. And the little horn, again, was the, uh, the beast that would come out of the revived empire. Now we get into Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel chapter 9 is really the Messiah that is going to talk about, um, it's really going to talk about the destiny of Jerusalem. It's going to talk about, in this vision, it's going to talk about Messiah. The Messiah is going to come. Now the Messiah is the one that is going to give hope. It's going to give a power. It's going to give, um, it's going to give rescue. The Messiah is going to be here for the people. Uh, so the Messiah will ultimately do the battle, and it's really giving the destiny of Jerusalem. It's giving the gravity of this holy covenant that is made. Uh, and one of these weeks, we're going to have to talk about this holy covenant of what is Israel. Uh, Israel is not a land. Israel is a people. In Romans chapter 11, Paul tells us that those who are a part of Israel are all who have accepted Christ as Savior. 
meaning you could either be born Jewish and have accepted Christ, being a Messianic Jew, or you could be a Gentile who has accepted Christ and you are grafted into the nation of Israel. So Israel matters to believers more than anyone. Israel matters to people who are believers in Messiah, in the Meshiach, in Yeshua Jesus. So then you have a final prophecy that is going to be given, and it's going to cover three chapters. It's going to cover chapter 10 through 12, and I'm not going to get into that one yet because we're going to get into that in about, uh, in about four weeks. We'll get into that. So today and next week, we're going to cover this section in Daniel chapter 9. So that is a little bit of the context. That is a little bit about what is going on and setting the stage, uh, a little bit of the background that we need to understand coming into J Daniel chapter 9 here today. And so we're going to read through not all of this. Today we're going to read through verses 1 through 20, or I'm sorry, 1 through 19, um, and get the stage and understand the context. Because what Daniel is referring to at the beginning of chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, sets the stage for the entire story. 1 through 3, Daniel is reading uh, the words out of Jeremiah the prophet, who would have been uh, the one who came before Daniel, who would have come a few years before Daniel and wrote Jeremiah. Jeremiah warned the people. The people of Israel did not listen. He warned that a great um, destruction is coming upon the nation, and it will be through Babylon. It will be through King Nebuchadnezzar. It will be through that empire. They are going to come. They are going to kill or take captive most of this nation. Uh, Daniel is reading that. In the book of Daniel, it records it in verses 1 through 3 that he's reading that. He is struck by what he is reading, and he then reacts to it. And he, sh he sets the example of how we should be coming before the Lord in our day, knowing that the end times events are coming our way, and it's, it's going to be falling upon this world. So he sets a wonderful example and the wonderful context of exactly uh, how we should be responding in the same way that Daniel responded. And I would guess that most of us do not respond this way, the way that Daniel responded. And then what's going to happen is in verse 20, and we'll get into this next week, all of a sudden now Gabriel, the angel, is going to show up again to Daniel, and he is going to relate what Daniel saw in the 70 years of Jeremiah with a new new vision called the 70 weeks of the of the Meshiach, 70 weeks until the Messiah comes. What is that going to mean, and how are we going to relate that? It's, it's an incredible prophecy that it should strengthen your faith. God wrote this 600 years before, 550, 600 years before the time of Jesus. It was fulfilled exactly in Jesus, in the exact manner it was supposed to be, and that should be a strengthening of faith. That I, I don't even question this, because if God could predict what that what was going to happen that far out ahead of time, um, and he, he laid out all of the events, then I should be strengthened in my faith, uh, not doubting God, trusting him completely that all that he says now is going to come true and I can lean upon him through all of this. So let's dive into Daniel chapter nine. We're going to read verses one through three, and then we're going to look at what Jeremiah's prophecy is that Daniel is actually referring to. So let's read this and I've got it on the screen, um, or you can follow along in your own Bibles. And I'm reading from uh, the TLV version, which is called the Tree of Life version. It's my favorite version of the Bible. Um, and, uh, and if you want to follow along that way, you can, uh, you can always use one of the Bible apps and it's available on, I think, all of the Bible apps. So let's dive into this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books. Now let's just stop right there for just a second and let me highlight a couple of things for you. And let me talk about a couple of the, um, a, a couple of the events that are very uh, important to understand. So let me, let me highlight a couple of things. So you have in the first year of this guy by the name of Darius. Now, where does that come into play? Well, this is actually going back in the book of Daniel to Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, was um, was ruling Babylon, but he was he was um, a, a wicked guy. Um, he had uh, he had done what was wicked in the sight of the Lord. Um, he had. Um, 
anyway, his kingdom was taken away from him through this incredible event of this thing called a, the handwriting on the wall. Uh, in chapter 5, it says, At that very moment, the fingers of a human hand emerged and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand so that the king could see the back of the hand that was writing. The color drained from the king's face, his thoughts alarmed him, his hips gave way, and his knees began knocking together. And so they had, he had um, taken all of the holy things of the temple of God, and he was using them in this party. He was drinking from them, his, his, his uh, guests, his concubines, uh, all of them were drinking from what was holy and set apart for God, so that this hand appeared out of nowhere, which would have freaked me out if I had seen a hand appear out of nowhere, wrote on the wall. Now, what it wrote was, uh, many, many tekel uparsin, which is translated to mean, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's the second metal on the statue. It was the second beast that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter uh, 7. Uh, then he says, uh, in, and, and then it meant your kingdom is divided, given to the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, they clothed Daniel with purple, put a gold around his neck, issued a proclamation about him that he would have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. But on that very night, King Belshazzar of the Chaldeans was slain. Chapter 6, verse 1. So Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, when I said, uh, you know, told you this here, you have Darius the Mede, it was his first year. So Daniel is writing in chapter 9 about his first year, which also corresponds to Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Now, there's more events because right after that is this uh, idea of Daniel in the lion's den. So some of the events, the visions are kind of put at the end of Daniel, and they really fall in the midst of the rest of Daniel. It falls in the midst of Daniel chapter 1 through uh, through 6, and so uh, these visions are intermingled in there. So I wanted to draw your attention to that. So Daniel is having a vision. Daniel would have been about, uh, you know, in his in his probably uh, 70s or, or 80s at the time. That's where, um, you know, that, that's about how old he was. And uh, Darius now is taking over. He's taking over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, that Chaldeans would have been the whole Babylonian Empire that the Medes and the Persians have just been handed. They took over. They conquered. They gave it. And God had warned this with the handwriting on the wall saying, your kingdom is divided. It's taken from you. It's given to the Medes and the Persians. So it says in his in the first year of his reign. So that, again, is Daniel 6, chapter 1, the first year of his reign. Daniel had a vision, and it was another vision that he was going to have, but the vision is going to come a little bit later. Daniel understood from the books that according to the word of Adonai to Jeremiah the prophet, the number of the years for fulfilling the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70 years. So I want you to note that. So there's this 70-year mark, and it was given to Jeremiah. So here's what's going on, is Daniel is reading the book of Jeremiah, or the scroll of Jeremiah at the time, and as he's reading this, he recognizes and realizes that the time of desolation would be 70 years. And so what does that mean to, to our understanding, is that Daniel understood that, that right now, that they were going to be in captivity for 70 years. The 70 years would be the captivity from the time that uh, Nebuchadnezzar showed up at the door where he took over the nation of Israel, he killed some, he took some away, and they would go to Babylon for 70 years. Now, at the end of 70 years, there is a promise given to Jeremiah, uh, from God to Jeremiah, that at the end of 70 years, that the Israelites would return. So now here was his response, and we're going to come back to his response in just a minute. Uh, Daniel's response is this, So I set my face to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So just note that, that this is how uh, this is how he's going to respond. He is going to set his face to the Lord God, and he is going to seek him by prayer and supplications. He is going to fast in sackcloth and ashes. Now, I'm going to come back in just a minute to his example of what he is going to do. Because um, the example that he gives is great. Uh, it's one that we could take to heart of how we should be preparing ourselves for the coming events that are going to happen. 
But before we get into his his example of what he did with prayer, fasting, supplications, I want to talk about Jeremiah's prophecy. Now, Jeremiah's prophecy that was just given that we just saw is that he says that it's going to happen in it's going to be for 70 years. So for 70 years, you're going to be in captivity. Now, the 70 number is going to be a an important number. 70 years in this particular case is going to have to do with judgment. Uh, it's going to have to do with not only judgment, but it's also going to have to do with restoration. Restoration that will happen at the end of the judgment. But there's a reason that judgment is occurring, and that is because of sin and disobedience. You have disobeyed me. You have um, you have not followed what I have said to do. You have sinned against me. Therefore, you will be judged. And your judgment is going to last 70 years. But don't worry, at the end of the 70 years, there will be a restoration for the nation of Israel. Now, this prophecy is given in a couple of different places. The prophecy is going to be given in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25 and also Jeremiah chapter 29. So let's look at this so we can understand what Daniel is reading and try to wrap our brains. Because again, this is all going to tie in because Gabriel is going to come and show Daniel a vision or tell, I'm sorry, tell Daniel a vision or, or a prophetic event. And it's going to relate to the 70. That's going to be important, uh, and it's going to re relate to sin and disobedience. It's going to relate to judgment, and it's going to relate to restoration and reconciliation. So let's look at the prophecies given specifically to Jeremiah. Now, here's the prophecy that Jeremiah was given by God in Jeremiah chapter 25. We have it recorded. Now, this, again, it was out of the sin and disobedience there will therefore be judgment. The judgment will last for 70 years, and then there will be restoration. But it is a warning that is given. And, and by the way, Jeremiah's words were not popular. In fact, they hated Jeremiah because of the words that he was speaking. Uh, they didn't want to hear that. It was going to be a, um, it will be a, uh, you know, one th a thing that they don't want to go through. So they, they hated Jeremiah for speaking these words, but he was speaking words of warning. And I think that that's an important note for us is that sometimes those words of warning that are given by people that are preaching and speaking the words of warning, they are not popular. They are, they are sometimes spoken against. Uh, sometimes people reject it. Sometimes people walk away. Um, they leave the church. They quit. Uh, they, they say evil about you. It's the same thing that happened to Jeremiah. And so Jeremiah was speaking the words that God had given him. Now look at these words that he says. Now, this again is the words that uh, Daniel was reading and Daniel was understanding. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah says this, therefore, Thus says Adonai Zavot, since you have not heard my words. Now, now notice that, that that's an important little concept. Since you have not noticed my words, um, you have not heard my words. Notice that. Since you have not heard my words. In other words, I have spoken and you have refused to listen to me. So there is a there is a refusal to listen, and there is therefore no understanding. Now that is that relates to like in the time of Moses. Uh, I'm sorry, in the time of Noah. Noah was preaching words of repentance. He was building an ark. He knew the timeline. He knew when it was going to happen, when it was when the flood was going to come. But people refused to listen to what he had to say. And as a result of that, they missed out on the opportunity to find salvation. So look at it again. It says that you have not you ha you have not heard my words. Therefore, I'm going to bring judgment. I will soon send for and bring all the families of the north. It is a declaration of Adonai. I will send for King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an enduring desolation. So, notice that word desolation. 
That is the abomination of desolation, same type of concept, same type of events uh, that will happen. God allows desolation. Why? Because you have not listened to my words. And because you have not listened, you have not obeyed my words. And because you have not listened and not obeyed my words, you are willfully in sin. And because you are in sin, I will bring upon you judgment. So those are the concepts that he is just saying. I will bring them against this, this land and against its inhabitants. God, God will do this. Sometimes in our theology, we think, well, God is just always good and always kind and always loving, and he would never do anything that would, would hurt my feelings or, or would hurt people. God brought judgment. And the end times events, the beastly systems that will come against the nation of Israel, especially, it says God did this. God would bring this. Why would God bring this? Because they refuse to listen. They don't obey. They're willfully sinning. And I will therefore bring judgment against them. The nation of Israel today is not a godly nation. In fact, it's a nation that is very anti-God in its behaviors and in its actions. There are some Orthodox Jews, there are a lot of secular people, and there are a smattering of Christians in the land. Israel is God's place. It is God's land. But the people have turned their backs on him. Therefore, God will God will bring judgment. And, and you think about this, how God restored the nation of Israel. Don't you think that people seeing God's hand and how he restored it would want to follow him? But they refuse. They will not. Therefore, the same words he gave to Jeremiah are very similar to the words that he gives to us in the end times. I'm going to bring for, uh, I'm going to bring forth destruction against you because you will not listen. You will not follow my word. You are in sin and disobedience. You will therefore get the judgment that I'm going to bring. He goes on to say this. Moreover, I will silence among them the voice of joy. That, that Boy, that's a powerful word. The vo I'm going to silence the voice of joy. I'm going to silence the voice of joy gladness. I'm going to silence the voice of the bridegroom. I'm going to silence the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land will be, notice this, it will be a desolate ruin. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon. Now, again, here's here's that uh, here's that word of warning that we saw in Daniel, and, and this is what we're what what I want you to understand. I'm gonna you're you're going to serve the king of Babylon for seventy years. Then it will come to pass when seventy years are completed, I'm then going to punish the king of Babylon and that nation declares the Lord the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, and I will make it a ruins forever. So here's what you have going on. You have God saying, look, you have, you have not heard my voice. You have not listened. So not listened. You have therefore not obeyed. So no obedience. You have, you have, uh, willfully sinned. By turning your backs upon me and not listening to what I said, you have, therefore, you're going to get the consequences. And what are the consequences? You are going to be absolutely desolated. In fact, so much so that the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones, the light of the lamp, it's all going to be a desolate ruin. This is the consequences. So here's what you have. This is the picture of what the judgment is going to be. God will bring judgment upon this world for the same reason. We don't listen. We don't obey. We willfully sin against him. Therefore, it will be left as a desolate ruin. Judgment will happen. Now, not everybody um, had that attitude toward God, but the majority did. The world had turned away from him in that area. Israel had turned away from him. The majority had turned their backs on God, and the result was sin 
and uh, the result was not listening, the result was disobedience, and therefore they will be desolated. And the desolation, look what it's going to happen. It's going to happen for 70 years. Again, there's that number again, 70. So 70 years is what is going to happen. So we've talked about this um, a few times. Jeremiah, or Daniel is reading. I know it's going to happen for 70 years. Jeremiah says it's going to happen for 70 years. You're going to serve the king for 70 years. Well, then he's going to say this, and then, now that's in chapter 25, and then you have chapter 29. By the way, one of these verses in chapter 29 is the most taken out of context verse in all of the Bible, in my opinion. Let's look at it. Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11. For thus says Adonai, now he's again giving that same warning, he's giving that same, uh, that same thing that's going to happen after, again, after 70 years, so after, at the end of the 70 years, now what, what did I say would happen at the end of 70 years? Well, that's where God said there will be a time of restoration. I am going to restore you. There will be judgment followed by restoration. For at the end of the 70 years for Babylon, after those are complete, I am going to visit you and I am going to fulfill my good word. So notice this, I'm going to fulfill my good word. I am going to bring you back to this place. I have a promise to give you. You have walked away from the promise. You have not listened to what I have to say. Therefore, you're going to get judgment, but I will not leave you in that place. I will bring you back to this place because I want to restore you than the most taken out of context verse in the entire Bible, because you now understand the context. For I know the plans that I have in mind for you, declares Adonai, plans for shalom and not captivity. I have plans to give you a future and a hope. Now, who is that given to? It's given specifically to the people who had been taken away into captivity for 70 years, that God wanted to remind them at the end of the 70 years, I am going to restore you, I'm going to give you peace, I'm going to give you a future, and I'm going to give you a hope. That, by the way, is the promise that is given to us as we go through the tribulation times. As we go through the end times events, God is saying, look, you're going to go through hard times. It is going to be difficult. I know you didn't do this, but the majority of the world has. You are innocent. You have followed me. You have committed your life to me, and I will protect you through this. Sometimes protection means even losing our lives. To, be, to have your life lost is ultimately protection because then you are with God forever. After the times of the tribulation, though, I will fulfill my good word toward you. I'm going to give you peace, shalom, completeness and wholeness, not calamity. I'm going to give you a future and I'm going to give you a hope. Now, that, that verse is often used to describe other things. It's put in graduation cards. It's put in marriage cards. It's, it's used all over the place, but it has nothing to do with any of those things. It's a promise specifically given to Israel who had been taken into capti captivity. In fact, at the time Jeremiah wrote this, they hadn't been taken into captivity. They were awaiting that. And he was warning about that. And he was saying, you're going to go there for 70 years. Go with it. It's going to, you know, don't, don't fight it. Just go with it. Let them, let it happen because this is what's going to happen. The nation is going to be judged. The nation is going to go through a hard time, but I have a plan for you. I'm going to restore you after 70 years. I'm going to visit you. I'm going to fulfill my restoration plan, my good word to you. I'm going to bring you back, give you plans for peace and a future and a hope. And that's what they can hang on to. And so now Daniel is writing all of this at the time that he realizes 70 years is about up. God is going to do something because he has promised it. And if he promises, it's true and it's going to happen. Now, uh, let's look just quickly at, at this whole purpose of these uh, of the 70 years, because the 70 years is this emerging pattern that seems to happen over and over again. And it's the pattern of sin and judgment and restoration. 
So, so I'm going to talk to you about why, why did they have to do this for 70 years? And then how is this going to tie into what we're going to talk about at the end of this chapter about the coming of the Messiah and the final end times events? So let's, let's keep going uh, with this. So, and, and here's, here's kind of the important part of all of this, that there is 70 years that is going to happen. Now, the 70 years are going to be multiple things. One, the 70 years is going to be domination by the nation of, of Babylon. That's one of the things that's going to happen in the 70 years. Babylon will rise and then Babylon will fall. And God promised this in Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12. These nations shall serve the king for 70 years. Then I will come and I will punish the king. So 70 years domination. You also had 70 years of captivity of the people. The people would be in captivity for 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, the people would return. That is the fact that the, the uh, uh, Jeremiah 25, 11, these nations shall serve the king. It's going to be for 70 years. And you're going to, according to Jeremiah 29, you're going to return to this place. And for 70 years, there would be desolation of the land. Now, this is the important one that I want you to understand. This 70-year desolation is, is something that... Uh, that you need to understand why this is happening because there's a few verses that deal specifically with why why the 70 year events um, are going to be happening so it's going to happen for 70 years okay so for 70 years you're going to have the desolation of the land that refers to the disobedience that they had committed in Second Chronicles chapter 36 verses 20 and 21. So let me let me just note that so you can look at that up later. So Second Chronicles uh, 36 20 and 21. Here's what it says. Just listen to these words. He that is God exiled to Babylon those who had escaped the sword, and they became slaves to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. So the king of Babylon took captive all of those who had not died by the sword, and they would stay there until the reign of the king of Persia. So that's how long they would be there. In fulfillment of the word of Adonai by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had paid her, uh, paid back her Shabbat rests, her Sabbath rests, for as long as it lay desolate, the Shabbat rest, the Sabbath rest, was kept till 70 years were complete. So he said, here's the reason that it's going to be for 70 years, because you have failed to keep the Sabbath for all of, the, all of this time. Now, what was the Sabbath? The Sabbath is not, is not the day of the week. The Sabbath referred to the every seven years they were supposed to let the land rest for one year. So every seven years was called the Sabbath year. And in the seventh year, you let the land rest and you let it do so for one year. If they had not kept 70 Sabbaths, that means for 70 times seven years is what the Sabbath was, that there were 490 years that they did not let the Sabbath happen. They did not follow the Sabbath command given by God for almost 500 years. Therefore, God said, if you will not keep what I have told you to keep, then I will make you, I will give you 70 years where the land will lay desolate to make up for all of the 490 years that every seventh year you did not keep the Sabbath. Leviticus chapter 25 is the command God gave. Leviticus, and let me write this down, make note of this. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 2, and, two through 4, says, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them, When you come into the land which I give you, the land is to keep a Sabbath, a Shabbat, to Adonai. For six years you may sow your field, and for six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year, there is to be a Shabbat rest for the land, a Shabbat to Adonai. You are not to sow your field or prune 
your vineyard. So every six years they could they could sow the field, but in the seventh year they were supposed to let it rest. That was the seventh year. It was the year of Shabbat. It was the year of Sabbath. They did not, for 490 years, they did not observe what God had called them to observe. That's going to become important. And I, this is this is what I want you to uh, to just keep in the back of your mind, uh, because in uh, as we get into the 70 weeks that we're going to talk about at the end of chapter nine, there's the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks is going to correspond to 490 years. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. There was desolation in the land. And as a result of desolation in the land, I'm going to make sure that the land rests for 70 years. You did not keep the Sabbath for 490 years. Therefore, I'm going to force a Sabbath on you for 70 years. Now, that's going to come into play because the 70 weeks is going to be equal to, it's not a week like you're thinking of, like a seven day week. This is going to correspond to 490 years. The 70 weeks is going to be 70 weeks of seven years. So 70 times seven years. Now that's going to be a significant number as we get into what's going to happen, Daniel chapter nine, in these end times events. So keep going with this one, one, a couple of final thoughts, and we'll look at the prayer of Daniel uh, quickly as well. So here is the here's the final thoughts, and this is this is why this uh, that I'm bringing all of this up to you. There has been an ongoing uh, pattern pattern of sin that should be of of sin and judgment. It's an ongoing pattern that has been in the Bible, an ongoing pattern that happens with sin and judgment. When you commit sin. And what is sin going to be when you fail to listen, when you say, okay, I will not, I will not listen to you, God, that is going to be sin. And that sin is going to lead to judgment. God only puts up with it for so long. I've warned you. I've warned you. I've warned you. I've, I've tried to speak to you. I want you to listen to me. You will not listen. You will not obey. You will not hear my voice. You're willfully committing sin. Therefore you will be judged. Now the iniquity that happened leading up to the time of the captivity of, in Babylon was 70 missed Sabbath years. That was a 490 year event. For 490 years, you failed to keep the Sabbath. Therefore, I'm going to force the Sabbath on you because of the 70 missed Sabbath years that you have done. Therefore, you will then also get for yourselves 70 years of desolation. I'm going to let the land rest and you're going to go into captivity because of all of your iniquity. You, you sin against me and because you sin against me, you will get the judgment and the continuing iniquity. Uh, you're going to go through the hard times. It's your own consequence. It's the consequence of not listening. That kicked off with the siege of ba uh, Babylon uh, over the uh, over Jerusalem, but then there would be God's blessing upon the land. I will bring you back and I will restore you. So sin and judgment always was followed by restoration. I'm going to restore and I'm going to bless you uh, at the end of this. I'm hoping you have learned your lesson. You didn't listen. You sinned. You get judgment. And I'm hoping you've listened to me now. You've come back. You've returned. You've repented. And now you're going to be uh, restored and blessed. And that happens through a process of repentance. Now, this is the same thing that happens in our lives. When we come to him in repentance, he restores and blesses doesn't mean all the consequences go away, but we are now made in right relationship with God. And so that's an important concept for you and your, your walk with the Lord, that you are restored through repentance. You're not restored just because the time passes. You're restored because in the time that's going on, you come to a point of repentance and he therefore restores and blesses you. Now, he will then give a command to rebuild. That's what will happen here in Daniel 9. In chapter 9, starting in verse 20, he's going to give this prophecy. A command will be given to rebuild. Reconciliation will occur, which will lead to Jesus himself and his crucifixion. Uh, then there will be the age of the church. 
that will lead to the final judgment upon the earth, which is called Daniel 70 week that you'll learn about as we get into it next week. All right, let's wrap this up because we're just about out of time and let's wrap it up with the example of Daniel. So Daniel's going to give this incredible example because Daniel was reading the Bible. He was reading the words of Jeremiah. He read the words about the 70 years. So he had 70 years of, of um, judgment that was going to happen, followed by the restoration that God had promised. And so what did I say led to restoration? It was repentance. When you repent, God restores and he blesses. That's what God wants. He doesn't want you to sin. He doesn't want you to disobey him. He wants you to listen. Listen to my word. Obey my voice. Do what I have commanded you to do. Follow my lead. And if you don't do this and you will, therefore you're willfully sinning, you will then get judgment. The judgment happened for them for 70 years. At the end of 70 years, there has to be repentance. And when there is repentance, I will restore and I will bless you. Now, that's what Daniel is going to do here in his prayer. So let's look at the example of Daniel and learn from the example of Daniel. So as he read the words of Jeremiah, the result of that was that he began to pray. He sought God, it says in verse 3, he sought God by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So what did he do? He prayed and he fasted. It says he set his face to the Lord. What does it mean to set your face to the Lord? It means that you turn to him. When we are in sin, we turn our backs on God and we walk away from him. But when we repent, we turn our lives back to him and we set our faces to him. So instead of turning your back, you turn to him. And, he, and here's how he turned to him. He turned to him in prayer in fasting, he made supplications, which was bringing requests before the Lord. He ultimately was going through a time of repentance on behalf of the nation of Israel. He was repenting for their sake. So here's what it says. I prayed to Adonai my God and I confessed. So confessed. I confessed on behalf of whom? Had Daniel done anything? No, Daniel hadn't done anything. He wasn't even a part of Jeremiah's, uh, you know, Jeremiah's time. It was Jeremiah's uh, timeline. It was the nation of Israel. Daniel didn't do it. Daniel was righteous. He was walking with the Lord. But I confessed on behalf of the nation. I realize that it's not about me. It's about this nation. Therefore, I confessed on behalf of the nation. I confessed on behalf of my people, my family, my, my loved ones. I confessed on their behalf saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him and keep his mitzvot, his laws, his commandments, we, notice that, we have sinned. We have sinned. You know, Daniel hadn't, but he says, we have sinned, meaning I am a part of this nation as well. It's not just about me. It's about this nation. We have sinned. And then he says, we have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands, your mitzvot, and your rulings. We have not listened to your servants and the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So we have done this. And that is, again, I am repenting on behalf of we. We have done this. We have, as a nation, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands. We have turned away from your rulings. We have not listened to your servants and the prophets. I, I think we could say the same thing for our land today. We have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have turned away from God's commands. We have turned away from God's rulings. We have not listened to whom God has put in charge, our servants, our pastors, 
the evangelists, the prophets. We have turned away from our founding as a nation, as a Christian nation. Not everybody was Christian in the same way that not everybody in Israel was following God. But a lot of people were, in fact, probably the majority of people were at our founding. But we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have acted wickedly, we have rebelled, we have turned away, and we have not listened to whom God has brought across our paths. You, Lord, are righteous, but shame covers our face to this day. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel near and far, in all the countries where you have banished them, because they have be behaved unfaithfully toward you. They, they have behaved unfaithfully toward you, God. We have been wicked. We have turned away. We have turned our backs. We have, we have uh, willfully done what is evil in the sight of God. Adonai, shame covers our face. Our kings, our leaders, our fathers, because we, and this is, this is again, his, his confession and his repentance, we have sinned against you. Now, again, Daniel, he had lived a very upright life. He had lived a righteous life. He was close to God, and it was demonstrated many times in Daniel's life. The visions he gave to Daniel, the ways he protected Daniel. Daniel was loved by God, but he is repenting on behalf of this nation who has been wicked toward God. The Lord our God is compassionate and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. we And again, look, we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of Adonai, El Elihenu, uh, by walking in his Torah that he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your Torah, your law, and has turned away, not obeying your voice. So what is Daniel doing? Daniel is essentially saying, look, we are guilty because we have not listened. We therefore have not obeyed. Therefore, we have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And we have gotten everything that we deserved. Your judgment has come upon us. In the same way that your judgment will come upon the world, the way that it happened to Israel at the time. And it happens because we just haven't listened. We haven't followed you. We have turned away. We have not obeyed your voice. Therefore, the curse and swarm judgment written in Torah of Moses, meaning God has already warned us. He's laid it out ahead of time. The servant of God has been poured out upon us. Notice, notice those words. It's been poured out upon us. Because we have sinned against him. So he has confirmed his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled over us by bringing on us a great calamity. Why will Israel undergo another time of, uh, of intense um, turmoil, the abomination of desolation, Jacob's trouble that it's called in the Old Testament? Because the nation still is doing the same thing. We have sinned, we haven't listened, we haven't followed, therefore, he is going to bring upon us great calamity. He warned, he warned, he warned, he's laid it out in his word, you will not listen, he will bring on great calamity. Under the whole heaven, nothing like this has been done to Jerusalem. Notice that. Nothing like this has ever been done to Jerusalem. It will happen again. As it is written in the Torah of Moses, all this calamity came on us, yet... We have not sought the favor of Adonai Elihenu by turning away from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So, so notice, notice that he says, look, all of this is going to happen and all of this calamity is happening and we are experiencing turmoil like we have never experienced before. Nothing like this has ever happened yet. Even in the midst of all of this term, turmoil, we are still uh, unrepentant. We are still not listening. We are still not paying attention to your voice. We are not still not paying attention to your truth. So Adonai was intent on bringing the calamity upon us. For Adonai Elihenu is righteous in all his deeds that he has done while we have not paid attention to his voice. So now Adonai Elihenu, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, 
Now, now again, going back to the whole notion of the Exodus, he, he, he brought you out. He protected you. He loved you. He helped you. He restored you. He, he uh, set you free from the bondage you were in. He brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and made for yourself a name to this day. You would have not been Israel had God not done this. Yet, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Again, his, his cry of repentance on behalf of the people, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, let your anger and your fury turn away, please, from Jerusalem, your city, your holy mountain. Because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of scorn to all those around us. So now, and we're going to close with this because this is the end of Daniel's prayer, his prayer of repentance, his prayer of, of turning turning uh, to God on behalf of the people. Uh, again, how, how are you restored? You're restored through repentance. So now, our God, listen to the prayers and the petitions of your servant and cause your face to shine upon your devastated sanctuary for the sake of my Lord. So please, turn your face back to Israel, look upon the sanctuary that has been devastated, and make your face shine upon it. Give ear, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city called by your name. We do not present our supplications before you because of our own righteousness, but because of your great compassions. Notice that, that phrase. We don't present our supplications because of our own, meaning we're not righteous, our own righteousness. We don't deserve it. We're sick. We're a mess. We are unrighteous. Please, please do these things out of your great compassion. God, it's all about you. It's not about us. By the way, that's a foreshadowing of, of Jesus. We deserve nothing. We deserve sin. Well, we deserve hell because of our sin. We deserve eternity apart from you. But God has great compassion. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to salvation. Jesus, out of his great compassion, came and died on our, be, uh, died on our behalf. He did it because he is compassionate toward us, not because we deserve anything. And so Daniel ends his prayer with this, Lord, hear, Lord, forgive, Lord, listen and act for your own sake. And I, I just want to make note of, of those words just, just as we wrap this up. He says this. He said, uh, I, I'm asking you, please, Lord, Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act for your sake. Not because we deserve it, but please just do it because you're compassionate and because you promised. So please, Lord, please do Please hear us. Please forgive us. Please listen and act. Oh my God, do not delay. For your city and your people are called by your name. Now, this is the ultimate model of how of how restoration happens in our lives. We we don't listen. We sin against God. We disobey him. We turn our backs on him, turn our backs to him. We are walk headlong into iniquity. We do what is wicked in God's sight. And God, therefore, brings judgment. And the judgment is not because God wants to. It's because he, we won't listen any other way. In judgment, God gives us the opportunity to repent. Repentance is necessary. It cannot happen without repentance. And when we come to him in repentance, what does God do? He restores and he blesses. And so what is Daniel doing? He is praying on behalf of the nation of Israel, repenting on behalf of the nation of Israel because of the sin and iniquity that we have done the judgment is going to come, but he is praying and repenting, hoping for restoration and hoping that God blesses. Now, in the end times events, 
all of these same calamities that have happened to the nation of Israel during Daniel's time that Jeremiah prophesied about that would last for 70 years, all of those same judgments will be coming against the world. And so God is giving us an opportunity, and the opportunity is turn to me, listen to my voice, repent, and I will restore and bless you. The nation of Israel has to do that, but we all have to do that individually in order to have a relationship with him, in order to become a, a part of the nation of Israel that we are grafted into, according to uh, the book of Romans chapter 11. Well, we're at the conclusion of this today. Uh, next time, we're going to pick it up in chapter 9, verse 20, and we're going to finish out chapter 9 next week with one of the most incredibly important prophecies in all of the Bible. It is the 70 weeks prophecy. It is a vision related from the angel Gabriel to Daniel. And the 70 weeks prophecy is about the coming of the Messiah, of the Meshiach, and when exactly he would come and what he would do. It's incredible. Please join me back here. Don't miss the one next week as we get into the end of Daniel chapter 9. Today, just set the stage for all that was going to happen because you have seen in what we have talked about in our things here today that we have talked about uh, those those concepts of one the the, um, the seventy years, and we also talked about the four hundred and ninety years. Now we're going to be talking about seventy weeks. That actually is not seventy weeks like we think of. It is seventy seventy sevens is the way it works out, which also corresponds to four hundred and ninety years. Four hundred and ninety years. They would be in captivity for 70 years as a result of the of the 490 years of disobedience. Now there's going to be a 490 year period that is going to be described that is going to have to do with the coming of Messiah and the end times events. And so we're going to talk next time about uh, a, 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 a period of seven, a period of 62, and then a, a, another period of another one week. So a seven week period, which is 49 years, a 62 week period, and then a one week period, which is another period of seven years. So you don't want to miss that. Please join me back here next time. Uh, next week will also be online. It will not be live, but the following week, uh, which is actually Easter week, uh, we will not be having the group. But after that, we'll be back together live and in person if you want to join me that way. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, on behalf of our nation and on behalf of ourselves, Lord, we pray as Daniel prayed. We pray for repentance. Help us, Lord, to take seriously the example of Daniel, to be in a position with you that we are repentant, that we are sorry for our actions and what we have done. We pray for this not only for ourselves, but we pray for repentance for our nation, which has acted wickedly and done what is evil in your sight. We have not listened to your word. We have not listened to your commands. In fact, today, our nation is moving further and further away from you, doing what is outright wicked and evil in, in your eyes. And so, Lord, we repent and we call upon our nation to repent. And we ask for you to do something, something in our land, Lord. Bless and protect and help us. Lord, I pray for your followers, those who believe in you and trust you, that you would keep them safe through the times that are ahead. Lord, be with us and continue to teach us your word. Be with us now as we wrap this up. And uh, I pray for each one out there, Lord, that you would bless them immensely and help them to stay committed to you no matter what comes our way. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for your word you've given us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Join me back here next week as we get into session number four. I'll see you then.